All right, looks like we are just about turning four o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you to everyone on Facebook and on Zoom for joining us. Um, I am extremely grateful and excited to have our, our friend and colleague, Lyle Belinqua, today. Um, but before we introduce him, we're going to go ahead and go through our usual introduction. We always begin with our land acknowledgement that the Crow, oops, sorry, that the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands this institution sits. Our mission related work is not possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. We are so grateful to all indigenous people and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Thank you to all of our partners. We are so grateful. And thank you to all of you who support uh, Crow Canyon in our webinar series. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We are almost entirely supported through donations and philanthropy and funding from outside sources. Uh, we are so grateful. We can't do our work without you. Um, please uh, stay in touch. Uh, keep keep visiting our webinars and our programs and uh, let us get to know you a little better too. As everybody knows, uh, our Zoom pretty well. Uh, if your Zoom has given you trouble, we are live streaming on Facebook uh, and a lot of our webinars are available after the fact on YouTube. Uh, during At any point during the talk, please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. Sometimes things get lost in the chat. And, um, and during the Q&A, we, we will get back to it. And we, if we don't have time for all the questions, we will send them on uh, to our speaker. Some really awesome things coming up. Are you there, Liz? It looks like you froze. All right, it looks like we're losing Liz, so I'll go ahead and take it over from here. Uh, we have a bunch of really exciting upcoming talks. We have Revisiting the Depopulation of the North American Southwest with Dendo. And oh, some of, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, you dropped out, so I was taking over, but you're back oh. now, so by all means, go on ahead. <laughs> I'm actually in the office today, too. I have <laughs> a terrible problem with internet, so thank you, Taylor. Um, so yes, uh, uh, week after next week, we have our Being Fremont uh, talk, which is coincidental because uh, Becky and I will also be out in, and Taylor will be out uh, in the UN Basin uh, working with uh, some of our other uh, tribal partners and looking at uh, Fremont rock art and archeology span at the same week. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anna, who is really excited to introduce this talk and introduce Lyle. So Anna, please take it away. Thank you, Liz, and thanks, Crow Canyon. My name is Anna Arsich. I'm the Visitor Center and Museum Manager at Canyons of the Ancients National Monument. And when we got asked to participate in the Four Corners lecture series, I knew um, that we wanted to ask Lyle Belenqua a second time around if he would participate with us. Uh, Lyle is an independent Hopi archaeologist, and I got a chance to meet him when I attended Crow Canyon Archaeological Center's Summer Institute last summer. Um, and during that amazing two-week period, we visited sites at Canyons of the Ancients, at Aztec and Salmon Pueblos, and at uh, Chaco Canyon. And one of the most powerful moments for me on that training was visiting Lowry Pueblo, a site at Canyons of the Ancients, with Lyle and um, we stopped at the Great Kiva there and he took time to share kind of the participatory nature of a Great Kiva um, and the fact that not only folks inside of the Kiva would be uh, participating in a ceremony, but that that sound would reverberate throughout the environment around Lauri Pueblo. And that was really touching to me. And um, I've shared a lot of, you paraphrased a lot of things that Lyle had shared um, during that training. Uh, and I'm very happy to um, hand it over to Lyle. And thanks again so much for presenting with us today. Okay, well, thank you everybody, um, particularly for all the introduction and the background on that. I feel very fortunate to be able to join you all today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get this going here again. Or maybe I did it wrong already. 
Uh, it looks like you may have optimized for video clip again, Lyle. Um, I'm getting How a black do? box on your screen. So I'm just gonna stop your screen share and then I'm gonna have you reshare one more time. And then on those two check boxes, just click share sound. All right. All right, that looks good. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can get into this. The upper bar is hiding the ability to. Um... Okay, here we go. All right, well, greetings everybody out there in, in the world. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I feel very fortunate again to be able to be a part of uh, Crow Canyon and Canyon of the Ancients Four Corners Lecture Series. Um, I'm gonna do a different approach with this little uh, presentation here. Um, I've given this presentation before in different formats and you can find those online. They're on YouTube in various places. I didn't necessarily want to rehash that kind of presentation. And so I decided to approach it from a different angle. Um, and I'm gonna do a little bit of reading as we go through this. Um, uh, I've picked four areas of my work that I've done throughout my career. And um, I've written essays about those pieces or about those pieces of my work. Um, you know, over the years. And so for me, I think it's an easier way or it's a more, it's an efficient way for me to be able to explain um, really some of my personal feelings about the work I do. When I reviewed uh, this, these presentations that are online in the past, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty straightforward. But one thing I, I felt that was missing was kind of uh, how I truly felt about it. And in terms of my emotions and feelings that, that I experience as I go through these different experiences as a part of my work. And so my writing gives me that ability to be patient uh, in my expressions about you know, my experiences. Uh, I'm not a very prolific writer. It takes me a long time to get things done, but I think that's part of the, the process for me in terms of understanding the work that I am doing and then allowing me uh, giving me the opportunity to express myself in a different way. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm pretty sure it'll be okay. This is who I am. Uh, you can kind of read that uh, on your own, but um, we're matrilineal here at Hopi. And so I take my mother's side. We are the Tepungwa, the Greasewood clan from the village of Bakalvi on Third Mesa. Uh, I am a proud graduate of Northern Arizona University Cultural or Anthropology Program. And since then, I've been working in archaeology for it's hard to believe 25 years, I think. Uh, I don't feel that old, but uh, sometimes it, it reveals itself in different ways. And so, uh, but again, I just think that I'm very fortunate to have had the experiences and meet the various people in my time in archeology span and they have all helped facilitate uh, my path to this point in life. And so uh, again, I'm, I'm very grateful for those folks. Uh, when I'm not doing archaeology, I row boats sometimes and I can take you on a backpacking hike, as some folks at Crow Canyon can attest to. And when I'm not doing that, I make jewelry and art on the side. And I have those kind of subset under archaeology because they are a direct influence from my time in archaeology. Archaeology, of course, gave me the opportunity to learn not only the scientific side of my history, but gave me the opportunity to learn the cultural aspects of well. So that directly translates into uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in public education. And so that's what I, I, I do as part of my guiding work is, is public education. And I, I take it very seriously. And I'm grateful that organizations like Crow Canyon give me the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of what I know and what I've experienced uh, throughout my time in archaeology. I want to point out the book there at the bottom, Baklavi, Journey to Read Springs. Uh, this book is out of print. It was published in 1988, I believe. But it's a really integral part of my understanding and my introduction to uh, the field of archaeology and anthropology. Uh, it's a very early example of how Hopis can participate in the field of ethnography and not only participate, but have real benefits given back to us. And so uh, this book is a very comprehensive look at the history of the establishment of my village, Bakavi, which is 
uh, Reed Springs Place here on Third Mesa. And so uh, if you come across that book out there in the world, I highly encourage you to pick it up because you will learn a lot, not only about uh, where I come from, but also, again, how Hopi has engaged in this type of work. And it's um, it's not a very scholarly uh, written type of book, so it's easily read. And uh, if you find it, pick it up. Speaking of books, um, I think in one of the abstracts I saw online, it references a volume in which I am a contributing author. And uh, just last night, as I was outside, you know, looking at the blue moon, I got an email from one of our editors uh, regarding this book, this publication that is forthcoming. Uh, that's the title of it there. Those are the editors involved. And I was very pleased to see these reviews come in. Um, particularly, you know, these two that I've picked out. And I'm going to read reviewer number one, just because I think it's a, uh, it really speaks to the goals in which, you know, I'm trying to achieve through my work in archaeology. And he writes, this is an extremely important contribution to the issues surrounding what has become known as indigenous archaeology, especially in relation to the decolonization of archaeology as a discipline. In one sense, it addresses what Bruce Trigger the preeminent historian of archaeology suggested in 1997 that archaeology would not be decolonized until there are a substantial number of qualified and practicing native archaeologists. To me, that is a, a, a realization in and of itself. Having been involved in this work for over two decades now and coming into it at a time when indigenous archaeologists were few and far between. We still are, but the number is growing. And so the realization that the numbers of us continue to increase uh, gives me hope that the work we do has meaningful influence to those out there that are interested, not only in archaeology, but in learning about who they are from a cultural perspective. And if anything, that's what this talk is about. It's about the communities that we represent and the, the learning that is necessary for us to continue to call ourselves Hopi or whatever tribe we, we come from or identify with. Part of that process is training and recruiting more natives to become involved in this work. And that's a big part of my work right now. But um, uh, just really pleased to see these reviews. Uh, this book is supposed to go to print in October and it should be available sometime next year. And I do want to uh, acknowledge all of the contributing authors. This is the second volume. There was a previous volume. So if any of the authors uh, from either the first volume or this volume are watching or will watch later, I want to say congratulations and thank you uh, for being willing to express and share your own individual experiences as indigenous archeologists. I think it's really important to point out that indigenous archeology span is a general descriptive term Indigenous archaeology is unique to each and every tribe that chooses to engage in this field. It is unique to the individuals and the communities they represent. So what I'm saying is there are multiple perspectives regarding Indigenous archaeology, and it's something that we need to continue to put forth out there in terms of encouraging those diverse perspectives to be presented and shared, not just with the outside, but more importantly, with our own community members. Um, if we are truly to continue on practicing our traditional ways, uh, we need to encourage the learning amongst ourselves. And so hopefully this book, this volume, when it comes out, will continue to encourage others to pursue the, the knowledge of who we are and where we come from, whether it's in academia uh, or other realms. But um, I will keep you notified uh, when this volume comes out, and I'm really looking forward to it. <clears throat> This is more of a personal statement here, this, this uh, quote that I included here, because while it, it has reflection on the overall clan history of Hopi culture, I think it's a pretty good description of how my career has gone. Um, I started off you know, as a university student, and I'll, I'll talk more about this stuff um, in, as we go forward. But I started off in the university setting and transitioned into the National Park Service where I stayed for almost a decade. And then I moved on to the Hopi tribe where I stayed for a while. Following the Hopi tribe, I have been an independent contractor, consultant in archaeology, doing field work, but also various types of public education, uh, working with different museums, uh, looking at different collections. 
doing my part, I think, to try and provide a Hopi perspective. I do need to state, however, that my perspective is solely my own. I do not represent the Hopi tribe as a whole. I am not a formal Hopi tribal employee, of course. Out here at Hopi, there are a diverse range of perspectives that you will find. There are 30 plus clans spread over 12 villages on three mesas. So you can imagine, uh, you know, among 16,000 tribal members, approximately, the number of perspectives that are involved within archaeology. And so that's uh, another key component of what our indigenous archaeology represents is doing our best, doing our part to provide the opportunities for all of those perspectives to be shared and presented. And so, um, again, this, this little statement here, I think, is pretty good in terms of how, how my career has gone and, and continues to go. I include these images of the circular kivas here because they do have cultural metaphors relevant to migration history. Uh, I'm not gonna get too much into some of those details. Um, I'm actually kind of moving away uh, from some of that kind of presentation. Uh, but these, these great kivas out there, uh, they do have cultural metaphors for Hopi people that relate to the movement of clans as well as my own journey. So uh, we'll keep moving on here. I have somewhat of an ambitious endeavor here. I have almost 20 slides. I think this is the most uh, that I've ever attempted to cover. Uh, we're gonna do our best to get through it all. I'm gonna keep moving. So where do I get my start? Where did it all begin? Um, that's really a, you know, a, an important part of, of my career. And it starts out here on the landscape. Uh, I'm very fortunate to come from a family that, uh, is dedicated to the land in many ways. We are farmers, we are ranchers, we are hunters, we are hikers, we are fishermen. Uh, my family was heavily and still is heavily involved in the outdoors, uh, whether it's through our ranching activities or our farming activities out here on, on our ranch area. And so it was really out here where I started to get little bits and pieces of who I am taught to me. As my dad and I would work the range, we would encounter archeological artifacts and sites out on the landscape. And he would take the time to explain to me a little bit about what they represent, who they came from and how we should interact with them. We were given permission to interact with this, this part of our landscape or our ancestral history out on the landscape. We were encouraged to pick it up, look at it, but always respect it and put it back. And so in that manner, I was given permission to freely interact with some parts of my ancestral history out there. And through these interactions, you again, you start to get little bits and pieces of what they represent, not just out here on our ranch landscape, but also around the village. Um, I can look out my window and my village is just right down the hill from here. But as kids growing up, of course, we didn't have a lot of the technological uh, distractions that, that the youth have today. So we were encouraged to get out and explore uh, the lands around our village. And so during summer vacations, during our weekends, we were always out and about uh, hunting, exploring, going to check out new places. And then we would come back at the end of the day and sitting around a large family dinner, usually on a Sunday afternoon, we would relate some of these areas to our relatives and they would tell us bits and pieces of that history which clans resided in that area or what is the historical event that occurred at that village. And so over time, we started to develop a mental map of the landscape around us. Of course, it was just all fun and games at that time. It was uh, part of just growing up out here at Hopi. It wasn't until much later that a lot of this teaching and a lot of that experience really started to come together for me in a very formal manner, and that would eventually influence my decision uh, into archaeology. It was also during this time, you know, um, in which I learned some of the stigma attached to the science, the field of archaeology. Hopi history has a, a well-documented history of interaction with early anthropologists, ethnographers, and archaeologists, and it hasn't always been beneficial. So growing up, I also heard the stigma, the negative stereotypes associated with archaeology. And so, you know, I had a, a skewed vision of what archaeologists did. Uh, I can clearly remember when I decided to pursue archaeology as a major, I came home and sitting around the dinner table again at one of those Sunday dinners, my grandmother asked me, 
she knew I was at the university and she asked me, what are you choosing to study? And I humbly replied, archeology. span My family sitting around the table all grew quiet and I could feel them looking at me as if I had gone crazy or something. And I clearly remember one of my uncles half jokingly said, why do you want to go join those grave robbers? And so that's kind of the, the perception I had growing up of archaeology. It was very basic. Um, and of course, it had a lot of stereotypes associated with it. And so archaeology was never considered uh, as a career or even something to be taken seriously, I think, at that point in time. It wasn't until much later, again, that I was able to put it all together and make it worthwhile for me and those that I work with. <clears throat> I'm including this uh, little slide here because I think it's a really good example of how we embed our intellect within our own cultural concepts. Um, our ranch is, is known by one name, the Arbar Ranch, but it also has the general term of Batui. Batui is a place name, it's a descriptive name, but it's also a metaphor. Uh, the literal translation of Batui is water bench. Uh, some people may interpret it as water at the edge or where the water emerges. But how my dad explained it to me out on the landscape was Batui is a metaphor for how springs are created. So how that happens out here at Hopi is the rain and the snow comes down and it percolates through the various sandstone and soil layers that make up the mesas out here. But embedded within those sandstone layers are layers of clay and shale. And so when the moisture hits those layers, it's forced to move horizontally until it finds an exit point and comes out as a spring. So that was a, a, an example for me in how we as Hopi people embed our intellectual knowledge within our own cultural metaphors and our own cultural understanding. And so uh, it was an introduction in terms of how things on the surface are not always as they appear that within Hopi culture, there is always deeper meaning to the terms and language that we use. And so why, why I wanna bring this up is because I think it's really important to point out that in this day and age, we are still struggling with how to implement traditional knowledge within formal Western scientific uh, paradigms and, and research uh, protocols. It's like putting the, the round peg in the square hole sometimes. And I don't think we're there yet. I honestly feel like we have a lot more work to do in terms of how we implement our philosophical statements into field methodologies and treatments that are active in terms of how we manage the landscape. And so this is a uh, part of the work that I continue to do and many others uh, within Hopi continue to do as well. But it was one of those instances in which I was given greater insight into Hopi culture and coming to realize that yes, there is more to who we are than what Western science portrayed us as, but um, we're, we're pretty fortunate to have these springs out here. I'm gonna read a little part here. This is my dad. Unfortunately, my dad passed away in 2020, um, but not before, you know, he had multiple engagements and experiences within archeology span and uh, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a quick process for him. It took time. When I announced to my family that I was pursuing archaeology, he didn't fully embrace it at first, and he, he wanted something different for me. At the time, uh, my dad was always in construction management, a construction worker. That's what he wanted me to pursue. And so my decision to deviate from his goals of mine uh, and pursue something that I wanted to do uh, may have disappointed him a little. But as this reading uh, will we'll illustrate to you, uh, he had a change of heart. And after this, I'll play a little video of him uh, talking about the springs that we have out there. Dispelling the negative stereotypes of archeology span remains a priority. Our indigenous community members need to see the value in this work. And we can achieve this by involving them to a greater extent in research initiated through our own tribal efforts. In this manner, the practice of archaeology can become familiar to them, much like it did for me when I worked side by side with traditional knowledge holders. Perhaps then perceptions will change. In one very personal instance, I was successful in changing the perspectives of my own father. Although he never objected to my decision all those years before, 
he never fully embraced it, at least at first. Over the years, as I studied and worked, he observed my willingness to learn more about our history and culture. This served as a way for him and I to have our own discussions. And eventually, he came to understand how the work I did was able to achieve positive results for our communities. In due course, he was asked to join the Hopi Cultural Advisory Group. And through this involvement, he found his voice and developed an eagerness to learn more about archeology, span some of it from me. I recall times when he would phone me direct from the saddle, expressing his excitement about encountering a new petroglyph panel on our ranch. In 2018, I was able to lead him and other Hopis to sites in the Bears Ears region where I was documenting and preserving ancestral dwellings. We spent a week touring sites and discussing Hopi history as a unified group. My father and I would often sit and talk about his latest field trip or whatever project I was working on. In this manner, he came to see how he and many other community and family members had unknowingly sowed these seeds in my head as a child. Throughout my career, there are many teachers who have and continue to help me in this understanding. Some are named, others are not. This writing represents my way of expressing gratitude to them. I think they would see it fit to be this way, as this knowledge is not solely theirs or mine, but represents the collective history, culture, and spirituality of many who have come before us. I consider myself fortunate to be included in their journeys as well as finding meaning and purpose in my own personal migration through science and tradition. Uh, that's an excerpt from the publication that will be forthcoming. So uh, you can keep an eye out for that. On uh, giving a view of the area that we haul the water in buckets uh, to the house. Uh, they were probably about a two and a half gallon or three gallon buckets, I think, and whatever kind of pail that was available, we'd bring them as kids and of course as younger kids in the rough terrain. You never ended up with all the water that you got, so uh, we made several trips. No matter what time of a day, if it was hot, we still were asking to come and get the water. Um, and the water container inside the house is, was a large pottery, a cistern that sat on uh, uh, a shelf there, a bunco that uh, uncle had and we poured in there and it, it always stayed cool. It was always nice and cool. And the thing that I remember about the water is that it had a little bit of, uh, I don't know what they're called, little minnows like. They're very small minnows. I used, I used to think that they, that's what the seahorses were like. But they were little 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 bugs inside the water that would swim around just by expanding themselves. And that, that didn't bother us, you know. We just dipped the water out and drank that. So uh, that was, oh gee, I, I remember that water being so good, of course. I should mention, um, you know, that was uh, about a few years into my dad's acceptance that he was also going to become an archaeologist as well. And so... Uh, that was part of a cultural landscape project that our Hopi Cultural Preservation Office uh, had initiated to record place names and other uh, locations out here on Hopi. And so with the help of Anthropological Research LLC, which is out of Tucson, Arizona, I believe, um, we were able, they were able to take my father out and record uh, him talking at our ranch, at our village, and a few other places. So uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, that video and that history recorded. On, uh... All right, we're going to move on. We're going to jump ahead about a dozen years or so. And uh, a lot of things that have happened or that have occurred in my career, uh, I'm going to unfortunately have to gloss over just due to time and my decision to kind of um, focus on, on many other things here. But by the time 1997 rolled around, uh, I was at the university setting. I was uh, two years into my career at NAU and I was failing miserably. Uh, I think I had tried every major that I thought I might be good at during that time and uh, had no success. Uh, my, my GPA was in the tank at one point something. 
I was in danger of losing my scholarship that I was on at the time. And I really didn't have any problem at that point uh, walking away from my university career, uh, in part because I had a really good paying job doing construction. Dad wanted me to. So being, you know, 20, 21 years old, making more money than I ever had in my life um, was a pretty good excuse not to go back to the university. However, my mom had other plans for me. And it was she who requested, she asked me if I would give it one more chance. And so through a very um, fortunate series of events and meeting people that I'll talk about in the chapter, but also in other presentations, uh, I was introduced to the field of archaeology and anthropology. And I really didn't have a choice at that matter, given that uh, I had nowhere else to turn to in terms of what major I was going to pursue. And through a, a fortunate meeting of Dr. Miguel Vasquez, uh, who I had some acquaintance with, I had gone to school, uh, high school with his son, and Miguel, Dr. Miguel Vasquez was out here doing work at the time at my village, uh, helping to restore uh, some centuries old terrace gardens that have been in use around the springs. They had fallen into disuse for a few years and through the work of uh, various organizations in the NAU Anthropology Department, uh, Dr. Vasquez was able to help our community rebuild those terrace gardens and they're still in use today. Uh, but it was through a, a fortunate uh, meeting with Dr. Vasquez in which he asked me how I was doing at the university setting in which I described to him my abject failure at everything I had tried and which he proposed, have you ever considered anthropology? And of course, growing up with the stigma of, of, that, I, of that I had learned from my relatives about archeology span and the related fields, that had never been a consideration for me. But again, I didn't have a choice. Uh, I was trying to live up to my mother's request. And so uh, humbly, I walked down to the NAU anthropology department, knocked on his door and said, here I am, what are we gonna do about this? And he, he took it to heart. Uh, he immediately enrolled me in some classes and the following year, uh, a really fortunate event happened for myself and others out here at Hopi. There were nine of us that were invited to participate in what they called back then a ruins preservation workshop. We wouldn't really use the term ruins or abandon these days, um, I won't really go into the details behind that again, that's information that you can find uh, elsewhere, but back then that's what it was called. And what it was really about was introducing native students to the field of preservation work, particularly within the National Park Service system. And so nine of us enrolled in that program and out of that program, three of us continued on. And it was a really uh, fundamental time for me to be out on the Waputki landscape. This was initiated through uh, the Flagstaff Area National Monuments there in Flagstaff, which encompasses three parks, Waputki, Walnut Canyon, and Sunset Crater Volcano. Uh, our work was mostly centered at Waputki and Walnut Canyon, but we did do some survey from time to time out at um, Sunset Crater. But it was during this time, uh, following the workshop, during my time as a student, that I started to learn more and more about the technical and scientific side of archaeology. And it was also during this time that I was introduced to what Hopi archaeology could be. In many ways, Wapatki is a homeland for me. It's an origin, um, not only for my career as an archaeologist, but for who I am as a Hopi person. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But what I did at the Park Service for a better part of eight years was study very intensely the architecture that my ancestors built out on the Wapatki landscape. Uh, I was part of the Vanishing Treasures program, which is still in exi existence. Uh, it's not as, um, you know, I think I was in it during its heyday uh, and it may have, you know, downsized a little bit in, in today's uh, world, but it's still out there doing some of this work. And the program was initiated to address these three uh, needs that they had, which was to um, keep, uh, get, get uh, caught up with the backlog of preservation work, as well as recruit and train new preservationists, and, and then develop proactive preservation programs so that, that we weren't um, solely reacting to emergency projects, but that we were being proactive in, in our management. What they didn't realize they were going to receive was 
introduction and education on the integration of Hopi perspectives within the work we do out there. And what I'm referring to is the history of preservation work here in the Southwest is filled with the use of incompatible materials, things like Portland cement, steel rebar, wire mesh, uh, materials that of course are not organic, so to speak, that they are, they work almost in, in opposition to the natural materials that the original builders used. I learned during this time about a Hopi philosophy regarding our ancestral villages. And it talked about them having a life cycle. That life cycle stated that yes, these structures, they are born literally out of the earth through mud, stone, and the various organic materials used to construct it. They, have a, they, they serve a purpose. Once that purpose is completed, they should be allowed to return back into the earth. The use of incompatible materials within the preservation program went against that philosophy. And it also created real uh, structural problems for, for the, the architecture itself. Um, Long-term exposure to UV radiation uh, turns Portland cement very different colors than what you originally uh, hoped it would be. Um, Portland cement also has differing rates of contraction and expansion, so it works against uh, the natural building materials. So we started to encourage the use of more organic materials, a return back to what the original builders used. This was somewhat of an idea during the Vanishing Treasures program back then, but they were uh, not really fully embracing it at that point. And I would say that um, through our consultation with the Hopi tribe and other Pueblo groups out there who encouraged the return to more natural materials, that the Vanishing Treasures program um, started to embrace more of that perspective. And that's how we pursued our work out at Wapatki and later at Walnut Canyon. So uh, I learned a lot of technical details during this time. This is where I learned the aspects of, of what scientific archeology span could be. It was also out on this landscape uh, where I learned what the cultural aspects of archeology span could be. I came into a time, I came into archeology span during a time that I feel was very fortunate. Um, Around the time I was starting to do archeology, span we had developed here at Hopi, our own cultural preservation office. It was established in 1989 under the director of Lee Kawanwisuma. Some of you may know him as Lee Jenkins. Uh, he is my maternal uncle. Um, I didn't know it at the time. I was raised more by my father's side. Uh, another contradiction you know, that I, that I seem to incur uh, during my life out here, but um, it was out here under Waputki landscape through our work that I was introduced to the work of this office. And more importantly, I was introduced to our group of cultural advisors. We know them as the Cultural Resource Advisory Task Team or CRAT. Uh, I think other tribes have since adopted that uh, acronym and, and use it uh, to describe their own advisory groups. What this group is comprised of is knowledgeable elders, both male and female. They're predominantly male, but we do have female representatives from time to time. These represent knowledgeable folks from our communities who are religious leaders, they're ceremonial leaders. They have in-depth knowledge of cultural history as it relates to clan migrations, who they were, where they went, and what we learned from them in the modern era. And so I feel very fortunate that through my work at Wapatki, I was introduced to not only the Cultural Preservation Office, but to this advisory group, because it was through them that I really started to see how the things my family taught to me as a youth were applicable to the field of archaeology. We were able, they were able to show me how Hopis use our intellect in explaining our cultural history, again, all of that cultural metaphor. And so it was here that I started to develop a, a fuller understanding of who I was as a Hopi person, not just in a general sense, but really on a personal level. For it was here at Wapatki, during my time at Wapatki, that I learned that the Wapatki landscape is truly a homeland for both of my clans that I identify with, my, my mother's side, the Tepungwa, Greasewood, and my father's side, the Tsuungwa or Snake Clan, the, the rock art panel that you see right in the middle is a, is a description 
of the Hopi Greasewood clan. It's just outside uh, the boundaries of Opatki National Monument, but it's in an area that the Greasewood clan claims as part of our ancestral uh, gathering area. And so these were the experiences that I was exposed to during my time at Wapatki. And it really helped me appreciate uh, who I was as a Hopi person. And it, and it helped me uh, become to identify as an archeologist as well. During my university time, I felt archeology span had an image problem for me because most of the heroes of archeology span did not look like me. They were a bunch of old guys with long white beards. And so that was my perception of what archaeologists, who archaeologists were and who they represented. And so during my time in the university, I had to struggle somewhat in terms of do I really belong in this field? But again, it was through my introduction through the Cultural Preservation Office and our CRAT group um, in which I, I developed a familiarity with it. And it became something that I started to become comfortable with and wanted to pursue much more. The end result of a lot of this work is evident and presented in the publication I have at the bottom, Becoming Hopi. Uh, that was a book that the tribe, our cultural preservation office in conjunction uh, with many uh, outside researchers, archeologists, ethnographers who we have collaborated with over a 40 year time period. Much of that research is presented in this book and it details the, the process in which Hopi had to engage in to develop a cultural preservation program, but also develop the vast documented knowledge that we now have about Hopi cultural history and culture out on the landscape. And so I encourage you, if you have an interest, if you haven't picked it up, uh, seek it out. Uh, it's available through the University of Arizona Press. Uh, the large hardcover book is no longer available, but there is a soft cover book now and an ebook, from what I understand. But um, again, it was out here at Wapatki where the idea of what I would become as a Hopi archaeologist really started to take foundation for me and archaeology started to become valuable and have true meaning and purpose in the work that I wanted to do. I want to acknowledge um, the crew that I worked with. As I stated, uh, out of the workshop, three of us continued on. Myself, uh, the gentleman in the lower right is Bernard Natsway, he's my one of my clan brothers from the village of Bakovi. On the lower left is Lloyd Masayantua. He is Coyote clan from the village of Ojaibi, Oraibi out here on Third Mesa. The three of us uh, spent many days together out in the landscape of Wapatki. And uh, we really came to understand what archaeology could mean for us as people in terms of documenting our cultural history and knowledge, and then sharing it with the outside world. As brothers would, you know, sometimes uh, we would uh, fight out on the landscape, not, not necessarily physically, but there were definitely disagreements amongst us. But it was a really important time for the three of us to be together and understand what our role could be within the field of archaeology. Bernard still continues on in, in archaeology. He's a contract archaeologist out there. Lloyd, he proved to have the most perseverance out of all of us. And he stayed with the Park Service and he is now a superintendent at Tuzigut, Montezuma Castle and Montezuma Well, all of which encompass ancestral Hopi history and culture. So um, out of that time, you know, we were able to produce three Hopi archeologists. And I include these little quotes on the side because here at Hopi, we have a saying that if we make fun of you, if we joke around with you, we really like you and we want to continue in that relationship. These little uh, statements on, on that I include here are our attempts to put uh, report titles past our supervisors at the time. They never made the cut, but it was our way of reflecting back to them that we really enjoyed our work and we were proud to be out there as part of the Hopi crew. I think all I think out of all of these um, would be titles, the last one is my favorite because if you've ever spent any time during the summer out at Wapatki, May, June, July, you will have yourself a transcendental experience out in the heat. And so uh, that's just a, a good reflection of, of the Hopi crew that we, that we were able to put together at that time and show, set an example really 
that we can do this work, that given the right support from within our community and outside, given opportunities like the preservation workshop and opportunities to continue our employment, we can make this a part of who we are. And so I think that the three of us represent some of that early attempts to establish ourselves as Hopi archeologists. So uh, just a, a quick acknowledgement to those gentlemen out there. <clears throat> I'm going to finish uh, with a short reading. Uh, these two individuals you are looking at are my paternal grandmother and my paternal uncle, my dad's older brother. Uh, they are both Rattlesnake Clan. Um, again, through my cultural teachings out at I came to understand that Wapatki is a homeland for the Rattlesnake Clan, not just the village itself, but the landscape has direct cultural ties to specific ceremonies that this clan is engaged in to this day. And they used to like to come out. Um, they recognize that. This is something that my grandmother, I think, always knew about Wapatki, even though she never shared it openly with everybody. Um, it was something that she carried from her childhood in terms of understanding where she came from. Uh, the upper right uh, petroglyph panel there is a snake petroglyph, which is carved on a boulder just as you descend into the village itself. And Hopi cultural advisors, as well as snake clan members, have identified it as marking the, the snake clan presence uh, at Wapatki Village. And so uh, this little excerpt I'm going to read is about them coming to visit me. My Hopi name is Hotsuma, and it refers to the undulating movement of the snake. I was named by my paternal grandmother, herself a Rattlesnake Clan matriarch, during my 20-day naming ceremony when she held me up and introduced me to the sun for the first time. Many years later, on a summer afternoon, as I worked in one of the rooms at Wapatki, I heard my Hopi name called out and echo across the valley. Slowly, I peeked my head over the wall. There stood my grandmother and my uncle who had come to visit their ancestral home and me. I accompanied them as we walked the interpretive trail and towards the end of their visit, the three of us split up as each lingered along the path. Catching up to my grandmother, I heard her voice coming from around the corner of a room block. I could barely make out the words she spoke softly in the Hopi language. As I rounded the corner, I saw that she was alone, facing an open room. She smiled when I asked to whom she was talking. Shrugging her shoulders, she said, nobody really, but I know that they are still here, listening and watching. So really fortunate to be able to uh, share some of those experiences with my family out on the landscape. Okay, we're gonna move into another one. This one is probably one of the hardest things I will talk about, and you'll have to bear with me if uh, it gets a little bit hard. I'm gonna talk about repatriation, and this is um, something that, um, it, it takes a lot for a native person to be involved in this process. It takes a lot of acceptance of past wrongdoings, and it takes acceptance of a responsibility. And so it's not something that I take very lightly. In fact, I, I debated whether or not I really wanted to talk about it. But I think it's really important for those of us that are involved in archaeology. I want to remind you that you are dealing with living cultures, that you are not just dealing with the past, that you have your work has direct implications on modern living native descendants. These are some of the, the issues I'll talk about when it comes to repatriation and, and more in my instance, reburial. I was uh, asked to participate in the reburial process when I joined the Hopi Culture Preservation Office in 2005. I think one of the first tasks I was given was to help coordinate and lead the reburial that was going to take place at Mesa Verde. This was the first reburial that occurred back in 2005 or six, I think it was 2006. Um, this involved a couple thousand individuals at that point in terms of who we were reburying. 
I had no idea what I was getting myself into at that point in time. And it was only through the process that I learned that I would learn just how difficult it is um, for us to do this work and actually assume the responsibility to carry it out. There are numerous considerations that Hopi had to de deliberate on. And much of this occurred prior to my time in coming into the Cultural Preservation Office. So these were things that I had to learn as I went through the process. One of which is that Hopi does not have a reburial ceremony. We never intended for these individuals to be removed from their final resting places. And so there was much consideration and discussion amongst our cultural advisors and community members if this is something Hopi should even be involved in. We didn't ask for this, we didn't cause this, but yet we are being, it's being kind of plopped into our lap and then we are asked to assume the burden of responsibility. Ultimately, Hopi did choose to assume that responsibility and in many ways, the leadership of how reburial is now carried out. Through trial and error, error we were able to I don't want to say refine, but come to understand what are some of the cultural protocols that we need to take into consideration when laying these individuals back to rest. And that required a lot of, again, a lot of discussion amongst our advisors, our staff, and, and other outside researchers who were helping us in identifying, working with in terms of their gender and their age those have specific influence in terms of how they are, are laid back to rest. Again, ultimately Hopi assumed this responsibility and we came to view it as one way that we could attempt to correct the mistakes of the past. Um, we also realized that in doing so, we were still making an attempt to show respect to our ancestors with the understanding that they are not just relegated to the past. Our ancestral history has direct influence to who we are in the modern day because we are living cultures. I recognize I'm out of time here, so I'm gonna just go ahead and jump right into this reading. This quote is from my uncle. Uh, I've often pondered what he really meant by it, but through the reburial process, it helped me understand what he was trying to say with this. Um, and hopefully this reading will give you some insight into uh, the meaning of his words. This process of repatriation illustrates the complicated relationship that indigenous peoples must contend with when trying to reconcile the past history of archeological research and our contemporary wishes to do the right thing. Personally, I would experience a flood of emotions and I was often left physically and mentally exhausted at the end of the day. It can reach deep into your psyche and test oneself. I vividly recall the first time I unpacked an infant girl. Unexpectedly, I felt tears roll down my cheek and I had to compose myself. Thoughts of my own daughters crossed my mind. Through blurred vision, I gently arranged her and moved along. I experienced frustration and anger from time to time, wondering why my ancestors were treated with such disrespect their final journey disturbed and their souls left uneasy. What I hope can be gained through this process is a sense of peace, not just for those we are reburying, but for those of us who remain, the living, the departed, hopefully we can all rest easier. I sometimes talk to these ancestors, holding them face to face. I reassure them that we are there to help. I let them know that no further harm will come to them and they are free to go. Other times I say nothing and work in silence, taking short breaks to clear my head and talk with the living. When all is said and done, I say a final prayer to my ancestors. I ask them to be at peace. We leave offerings and smudge ourselves in juniper smoke, washing away any negative feelings or emotions from the day. I never go directly home and I find a secluded spot to camp out for the night. I build a fire and sit staring at the flames, slowly releasing the remainder of my emotions from the day. I concentrate on bringing myself back to this world. I wonder if what we really do corrects the mistakes of the past. Only time will tell. I may never know who these people were in real life, 
we only cross paths in our journeys to our own final destinations. Yet, I fall asleep knowing I will awaken to a new day and see in the eyes of my own children the spirits of my ancestors. <clears throat> I'm going to end, um, that's a little abrupt on that ending, but I think that's uh, the most appropriate way to, to end that experience. I'm going to end with just an adventure, just something that is kind of fun uh, that I wouldn't have been exposed to if I wasn't an archaeologist, most likely. And so, um, yeah, we'll end on a, on a little bit more positive note there. But uh, through my work as an archaeologist, like I stated, I've been introduced to uh, the career of being an outdoor guide. And so I'm fortunate to be able to lead uh, folks across the landscape um, and show them and share with them different parts of my cultural history. And it was during one of these excursions out into the field with one of my groups in which we encountered or I encountered what I truly feel is uh, uh, an ancestral uh, calendar of some sort. And uh, this is the story talking about that. Following that initial discovery on my behalf, on my part, uh, one, of, one of the individuals I had in my group really had an intense interest in archaeoastronomy. And so he and I made a pact, we made a decision uh, that we would come back the following year to follow up on my hunch. And uh, he was you know, more uh, adept at some of the software uh, programs that help you determine when and where certain celestial bodies will be at a predicted time. And so these are just some of the graphics that he generated. Uh, I have no idea what they're telling me, but they're just kind of cool. And it's, it's uh, interesting to know that there's that kind of technology out there that allows us to predict uh, some of these events. And so uh, the following year, him and I and uh, a few friends and family, uh, we journeyed back into that landscape. And uh, this is a retelling of that experience. Here's a full photo of, of that uh, rock art calendar. <clears throat> Excuse me. We sit quietly. <clears throat> no. <clears throat> we sit quietly, occasionally whispering words, <clears throat> motioning. <clears throat> Oh man, that went down the wrong way. <clears throat> One second, please. Okay, here we go. We sit quietly, occasionally whispering words, motioning with our heads and lips. The air is charged with anticipation. Will it happen? Overcast clouds drift between us and the moon, casting distorted shadows into the canyon and across our bodies, illuminating us with light, then darkness. We are patient and remain seated, gazing upward. It feels quiet, but not entirely. Singing crickets and a gentle breeze through the cottonwood trees are the only sounds. Boulders surrounding us contain many more petroglyphs, anthropomorphs, snakes, footprints, bird tracks, all in suspended animation. High up on the sandstone walls behind us stand other figures painted in white. They stare out over the deep canyon, sentinels guarding the secrets of the past. As the moon nears its final approach to the cliff face, we all lean forward. We prepare for the inevitable. We hold our breasts, eyes widening, hearts beating in our ears. A deafening silence descends over us. Go silent, winds cease, and the earth's rotation seems to slow, prolonging the suspense. Just as the rim of the full moon meets the upper cliff edge, the forces of nature determine that no, not tonight. The clouds rush in, shielding the moon, which seems so close that we can see its cratered surface. The moon vanishes behind a veil of secrecy, disappearing as a blurry orb behind the canyon walls. Tonight, there will be no great reveal of the ages old calendar. We sit in disbelief. How can this be? We traveled so far, why are we not rewarded? Looking around at each other, we slowly lean back, releasing the air from our lungs in one final acceptance of this reality. I am the last to leave, but I linger. I say a few words to the spirits of the canyon, 
thanking them for this experience. I take one last look, wanting to burn this image into my memory. The faded moonlight still shines from below the horizon, enough that I can barely make out the bird-headed figure. I half expect him to raise his hand and wave. And I think we got through it. So that's really all I have. Um, I know that was a quick journey. Uh, again, I had to skip over many, many details about that experience. But what I hope you gain from that is a sense that, again, archaeology is about the living cultures of who we are, that we still have those connections in place because of the traditions that we continue to practice as indigenous people. I also wanna take this opportunity to encourage my fellow indigenous counterparts, whether you are an archeologist or not, whether you are a field worker, whether you are an academic or whether you are a community, to get out and experience your landscape, to get out and know who you are, to seek out those that may be willing to teach you and help you with that understanding. For we truly need ourselves to understand who we are in order to better lead our people as well as educate those that we wish to lead out there. So uh, I wanna thank you all for sticking with me through this. Uh, this was a new format for me. Um, and I don't, I don't think we have time for any questions, but uh, there's some contact info. Uh, my email is there. I do have a, a small blog that you can subscribe to. It's free of charge. Uh, I post things, my writing, uh, different events or anything else that uh, I'm involved with. So. Uh, once again, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to share a little bit about the work that I've been doing and those that I work with and for, uh, and I would just wish you all uh, a good day. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, the... Um, it is a gift that we probably don't or certainly don't deserve to have you share those deeply personal um, feelings and experiences uh, with us. So we are very grateful. Um, and I think a lot of lessons that we can share with the people we work with and our staff about um, what it takes for native people to engage with the practice of archeology span in general. And I really hope that 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 the gift that you give us is something that we can help to build compassion and empathy uh, with non-native archaeologists. So, Becky, maybe you can take over for me for a sec. Thank you, you Liz. Know, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, you know it. It it's uh, we we are blessed, you know, to have have you share so much with us, Lyle, to give that that native perspective is so important and it's something that has always been lacking in in you know in archaeology and you know it's 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 a it's a form and it's a way of uh moving in the right direction in which we at Crow Canyon are trying to do as well and you know with with that input and you know that knowledge and you know, it's, you know, we're, we're truly blessed. So thank you so much, Lyle. It, it meant a lot to all of us. Yeah, thank you for from Canyons of the Ancients as well. You know, it, it really helps us to understand and appreciate your ancestral homelands and places like this. And uh, we really look forward to getting your new book and seeing what comes out next. You. I think we're um, we're a little over time anyway, and I think that people are thinking hard more than they're asking questions right now, which I think is a good thing. So I think we'll we'll go ahead and and uh, be respectful of of Lyle's time that he shared with us, and um, and go ahead and uh, and 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 close up. So Lyle, thank you. We're really lucky to have you in our lives, and thank you, Anna, for arranging for this for this incredible talk. So lot to think about. Thank you all. Thank you. Pray for rain. Pray, Pray for, for rain. rain. <laughs> we'll see you all. <laughs>